So welcome to our webinar, Systemic Racism and Climate Policies, What About the Children? Before we begin, all of us at the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health respectfully acknowledge that our advocacy, education, and learning uh, across the country takes place on the occupied and unceded lands of many Native American tribes. To acknowledge this land is to recognize its long history and our place in that history. It's to recognize that these lands and waters and their, signif uh, and their significance for the peoples who lived and continue to live in this country and whose practices and spiritualities were, are, and shall always be tied to the land and the water. Uh, today's webinar is the first in a series for this year as part of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship Program. The CHEF Fellowship Program uh, is a program that recognizes the need for more diversity in climate and health leadership and a sharper focus on equitable climate solutions. The goal of the fellowship is to empower doctors of color from populations that face greater burdens from uh, climate effects and are underrepresented in medicine to become leaders in climate and health equity education, advocacy, and policy solutions. I'm Dr. Mark Mitchell, the founder and director of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship Program. Also joining me from the consortium to run this webinar, our Western Co Cohort Fellowship Program Manager, uh, Jordan Carter, and our student intern, Clarissa Payton. They will be available throughout, uh, through the chat to answer any technical questions that you may have uh, during the webinar. Our other team members on the webinar are Dr. Venice Curry and Dr. Kimberly Williams. This webinar series is hosted by the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. And you can see um, a chat and the link uh, will provide a little bit more detail about us. And it's held for one hour on the second Friday of each month from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available on our website for future viewing as part of our equity resources page on the consortium website. Uh, today, we are honored to have Dr. Sokobi Wilson. Dr. Wilson has over 20 years of experience as an environmental health scientist in the areas of exposure science, environmental justice, environmental health disparities, community-based participatory research, water quality analysis, air pollution studies, built environment, industrial animal production, climate change, community resilience, and sustainability. But other than that, he has no expertise. Um, that's a joke. Uh, uh, he works primarily in partnership with the community-based organizations to study and address environmental justice uh, and, uh, and health issues and translate research into action. Rather than using more of our time to further discuss uh, his impressive work, we're going to place a link to his bio um, in the chat. Uh, the general format for today's webinar will be a 30-minute presentation by our speaker, followed by 20 minutes of questions and answers from our audience. Uh, feel free to uh, put your comments, links uh, that you may recommend, or any questions that you may have uh, for the presenter into the chat box at any time during this presentation. We will get to as many questions as we can during the question and answer period. Please keep yourself muted so we're not interrupted by background noise. Uh, so Kobe, you can go ahead and begin now. Cool. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, can I get screen, uh, uh, share screen, spoon and rizzle? Share screen? I got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. So yeah, so excited to be here today. Um, I'm Shakobi. Hope y'all excited too. It's a Friday, so I try to keep it pep, keep it hype, keep you awake. So we're talking about environmental justice uh, today. Um, you know, you can't talk about EJ without talking about racism. So if you think about racism in this country, as, as y'all know, as, as, as uh, you know, in the medical field, racism is a public health issue. It's a, it's, 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 it's a pandemic. I'm gonna use the word syndemic differently later on, but it's a pandemic. 
Racism uh, in America, regardless of what people say, is uh, America's apple pie. Racism baked in the walls of America. So, you know, when you think about environmental justice issues, you're talking about environmental racism, you're talking about structural racism, right? Or, or structural is a nice word, structured racism, to be more specific. And if you think about the, you know, the EJ movement itself, what is environmental justice? It's a social movement. It's a child of the civil rights movement. It's a movement about where we live, where we work, where we pray, where we play, where we learn. Let me say it again. Where we live, where we work, where we, where we, where we play, where we pray, where we learn. It's the macro environments we find ourselves in, right? It's a movement against uh, the different burden of environmental hazards that locally want to learn use Lulus, what we call them. Incinerators. Uh, for those of you who may know about Baltimore, the Wool Brain Incinerator, or the Medical Waste Incinerator in Baltimore. Uh, power plants in Brandywine, right? Uh, chicken farms, those of you go down to Ocean City and wonder what that smell is. That's chicken. Poop, right? I like to call it um, litter. Nice word for poop, okay? The disproportionate number of chicken farms uh, in, in Maryland, that part of Eastern Shore, or in Delaware, or in Virginia, right? Um, you, you think about issues of highways and byways built on purpose through black and brown communities to displace them, right? The National Highway Defense Act. So it's about these environmental hazards that, that emit pollutants, that impact health. And these facilities tend to be disproportionately in communities of color, in low wealth neighborhoods, in neighborhoods that have been marginalized and invisible lives, right? I like to say COVID-19 has made visible the populations of policies, many of them racist policies, structured racism, have made invisible in this country. So I have Dr. King, Dr. King here, as you know, was it uh, less than a month, 54 years ago, um, he was assassinated. April, uh, 54 years ago, he was assassinated. And you know the history about the sanitation worker strike. These were black men who were, you know, working on the job, who were walking around in filth, covered by filth, um, were not being protected, were being mistreated, were not being paid well. So you, you, you saw black men carrying around signs that I am a man. They're saying recognized by humanity. When we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about communities saying recognize our humanity. They've been dehumanized. They've been commodified. They've been devalued. They've been criminalized. And why I use the term criminalized, you think about the carceral space. You got folks who, the school and prison pipeline are more people of color in prison than other, than other groups, right? But it's also how people uh, get criminalized or this carceral space, uh, how their bodies are treated, how the communities are treated, right? Uh, you know, you think about uh, uh, stop and frisk, for example, when you think about racism and, and, and the system of oppression, you think about uh, issues around, uh, you know, drug treatment, right? You think about issues around, as I already said, the school of prison pipeline, uh, criminal justice reform. Even for those of you who know this better than me, uh, look at the issues of maternal mortality rates, right? Black women die three, four times more than white women. Why is that? It's not income. It's race. Why is this? Is that racism? Is it cultural competency? Is it some genetic? The reason why? That so many black women die? Reproductive justice issues. All these things are connected, right? So you think about environmental injustice. We're talking about this carceral space, how communities are getting dumped on. They get sacrificed. You know, they're dealing with toxic trauma. Uh, and let me slow down a little bit. You think about that toxic trauma. If you think about it from a public health model, right? And I'll get to this again. I may repeat myself. But it's this intersection of different stressors that people experience. Uh, in these communities that have been overburdened by hazards and, and local one land uses. The history of the movement, you think about um, Reverend Dr. Uh, Benjamin Chavis, uh, uh, Benjamin Chavis' his work in WCP uh, with the PCB landfill fight, Paul by Phenomenal Landfill fight, for those who know about Warren County. When you come down Virginia, that's the first county, when you're 85, I think you cross the uh, state line. It used to be a big tree before the construction work, for those you know about that part of the country. The construction work, they're not going to, the, they cut the tree back. They're trying to expand the roads. Uh, but that's Warren County. Primary Black County, they're going to place this landfill there without any real input from the community. These com these community folks, primary Black, uh, low wealth, uh, low wealth folks, were impacted. So that's where the, the movement got it got its national attention. So the definition of environmental justice: fair treatment, meaningful involvement of all people, uh, uh, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, income, education level. I call this the kumbaya definition when it comes to the implementation of environmental rules, laws, and regulations. Kumbaya, yeah, we know all people. But if it was all people, we wouldn't be having this conversation today, okay? If it was all people, we wouldn't have the Flint water crisis. All they had to do was comply with the lead and copper rule. If it was all people, you wouldn't have people in St. James Parish who don't have access to water. 
It was all people. You want to have people in Baltimore, in Richmond, California, in Cancer Alley, right? In parts of L.A. You got folks in New York. You got people in Harlem, right? You got folks down in Charleston, South Carolina. You got folks in Detroit, folks in Chicago who are dealing with differential air pollution. It was all people. If the Clean Air Act uh, protected us equally, it would be all people. We know it's not all people. That's why I don't like this definition. It's an environmental equity definition. Fair treatment. It got modified to say just treatment. We want justice. So it's justice focused. Because fair does not necessarily mean just. Fair could be, hey, you got eight pollution sources. Uh, we got zero. Moving forward, we're going to be both treated fairly the same. I still got my eight. You still got your zero. That's not fair. We want justice. Okay. And you have the definition of the EJ community. As I already said, significant number of people, color, low income folks, tribal uh, representatives, tribal nations, where they experience more risks, more toxicants, more uh, poor health, environmental conditions, poor health outcomes. So I like this definition better. We read it real quickly. It's a social terms of health definition before we're talking about social terms of health. Dr. Bunyan Bryant, I forget when he coined this definition, Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan said, environmental justice is served when people can realize their highest potential well, I experienced the isms, not just racism, ableism, all kinds of isms in there, right? So social service health, decent paying and safe jobs. So unjust jobs to just jobs. Quality schools, unjust schools to, to just schools. Uh, and recreation, unjust recreation to just recreation. Decent housing, unjust housing to just housing. Adequate health care, unjust health care, you know, moving away from medical apartheid to, to just health care, right? You can have, you know, green space. Think about you know, supermarkets, food apartheid, right? Just food infrastructure. Communities free of drugs, crime, and violence. Community empowerment. Cultural diversity and biodiversity are supported. Justice prevails. Restorative justice, procedural justice, distributive justice, right? Love this definition. Much better definition than EPA definition. Environmental racism, again, was a term coined by uh, Benjamin Chavis in that fight against the PCB landfill I talked about before. Environmental justice is trying to undo environmental racism. So regardless of what you heard in the last three weeks about the administration saying that we're going to address environmental racism without just race, you can't address environmental racism without just race, y'all. Sorry. Uh, one of the first studies on these issues was toxic waste and race 1987 that found that race, based on the science, is the single most important predictor of the distribution of environmental hazards. Not income, but again, race. Let's tell it to the White House. I'm sorry, getting too political, but EJ is political, Okay. And then one of the first books on environmental justice was Dumpin' and Dixie, uh, written by Dr. Bullard, who's been called the father of the EJ movement. Uh, you know, I like to call Dr. King the grandfather and, uh, you know, maybe Du Bois, the great grandfather, want to get off, off, off subject. But y'all get what I'm saying? And in my frame with environmental justice, it is traditional frame that been overburdened by hazards, right? So, you know, I talked about, you think about incinerators, landfills. Uh, petrochemical operations, chemical plants, you know, factories. Y'all remember the Passaic fire uh, a few weeks back, maybe a month ago now? You had the fire down in North Carolina at a factory. You, you keep having fires and spills and leaks and explosions in Houston, Texas. Texas, where you have all those petrochemical operations. And you know about Houston. When you fly into Houston, when you get to Houston, that smell you smell, that's the petrochemicals you're smelling. Like, what's that odor? Petrochemicals. The Houston Ship Channel is the largest petrochemical corridor in the country, in the North America. Um, so you, you have these pipelines, right? You have CAFOs, concert animal feeding operations. I've mentioned chicken farms. For those of you from North Carolina, maybe you know about industrial hog farms in eastern North Carolina, Duplin County, Sampson County, right? Wayne County, Green County. Uh, you go to cattle feed lots in, in California, uh, New Mexico, Oklahoma. Who's impacted? Uh, pesticide exposures and application. Who's impacted disproportionately? So different burden burden hazards. Then you have the social justice self again, again, uh, brought in again, the high concentration of psychosocial stressors, right? So you're overburdened by hazards, high concentration of stressors. And as I said before about, you know, Dr. Uh, Bunyan Braun's definition of, you know, recreation and food, he said communities are overburdened by hazards and stressors. I was going to come back to this point about stressors on this slide. They also have a lack of access to health promoting infrastructure. Uh, Antonovsky uh, uh, coined this term back in the 60s or 70s called uh, salutogenesis and how you promote health, wellness, well-being across all dimensions of the environment. Of the environment. I think it's very important to think about climate change, mitigation, adaptation. We got to have a res talking about resiliency. We got to bring salutogenesis. It's about how to help promote the infrastructure, right? Salutogenesis. 
So what are some food solutions? You know, communities don't have access to supermarkets, right? What are some uh, environmental solutions? People, communities don't have access to green space and parks, right? Uh, what are some health solutions? Folks may have limited access to healthcare, right? So salutogenic infrastructure, where well, they may have more pathogenic infrastructure, fast food restaurants, pawn shops, paid and lenders, quick loan facilities, pollutants, as I mentioned already, these factories, et cetera, or, or lack of access to sewer water infrastructure. I think one of the biggest issues in the country, major issues in this country, and globally, you think about globally wash issues, right? In the U.S., uh, having access to publicly regulated sewer and water infrastructure. 20% of our population still lives in rural areas, right? Most of those folks are on well water and, uh, you know, septic tanks. And so not having access to safe drinking water is an EJ issue, particularly for rural areas. We look at our colonials on the Texas border, we look at our brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters who live on reservations, don't have access to publicly regulated sewer and water infrastructure. Why COVID-19 hit Navajo folks so, so hard? Because they have any running water. How you gonna wa- how you gonna have good hygiene? You can't wash your hands. You don't have water. Uh Sand Branch, Texas, outside of Dallas, historic black neighborhood, don't have sewer and water. They ran at the border of Dallas, but no sewer and water infrastructure. Denmark, South Carolina, big issue around water. You don't remember Denmark, Bessie, uh, HBCU, Denmark College. Water, 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 basic amenities, big time EJ issue in this country. So burden disparities lead to exposure disparities, lead to risk disparities, lead to these health disparities, okay? So differential burden, differential exposure to pollutants, differential risk, particularly around climate change, right? So think about various climate-related perturbations. So I get to those slides, I need to speed up a little bit. But, and then also these health disparities. We, we talk a lot about health disparities, also health equity. But then what's the sort of like this process, right? So exposure disparities, particular matter, uh, lead, right? Uh, one of my little risks, like I say, how are you gonna put American first, you gonna put your kids first? Look how many kids have been thrown away because they've been exposed to lead. You know, you know, neurocognitive uh, impacts of lead. And, li- and in many ways, we failed on lead in this country because we know lead is a, uh, a, a, what it does to children, right? Not just flint, all, you know, all over the country we have lead issues. Not just drinking water, not just lead paint. paint. We have people who still live, uh, live in their lead smelters. Uh, we still use lead in some industrial uses, right? So we, we haven't completely gotten lead out of our uh, supply chain and its usages. Uh, health outcomes that are relevant, asthma, heart disease, stroke, diabetes. Race is important again, regardless of what the administration said. Again, not to get too political, but EJ again is political. We know there's a pollution a disadvantage for folks of color and a pollution uh, advantage for whites. Okay. So, you know, people of color, black folks, uh, Latin brothers and sisters are experienced, Asian brothers and sisters are experienced more pollution than their white counterparts. And I used the term before pandemic. I said the term syndemic. We're talking about a syndemic, right? I'm going to use the term differently than probably y'all use it in the medical field. Uh, you know, uh, multiple pandemics. Of course, in the term syndemic, you talk about dealing with multiple systems at the same time, right? But you got a pandemic of racism. You got a pandemic of economic uh, apartheid. Remember when, um, uh, uh, was it, was it um, when uh, John Lewis was eulogized? I think the Reverend said that, you know, he, t- he talked about plantation. We got a plantation economy in this country. Think about all those essential workers who got exposed to SARS-CoV-2 and had COVID-19. Uh, could you be COVID, uh, why we had disparities of COVID-19, morbidity and mortality? Those essential workers are what? Nine of the 10 essential workers, primarily people of color. You know, restaurant workers like my niece who got it. Nurses like my sister who got it. They both survived. Uh, folks, meatpacking plants, agricultural workers, folks in transit, right? People who had to go out of work and not like me who could stay at home because I'm a professor. I'm not a central worker. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have increased exposure. Sorry, I was going to a case frequency, young exposure assessment, duration. Right. That's important. So the syndemic again, racism, economic apartheid, the the coronavirus, climate change, and environmental justice. That's the syndemic that folks are dealing with. The communities I work in, the communities that I serve, who are dealing with those multiple stressors. Right. Not just chemical stressors. But biological stresses like 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 SARS-CoV-2 or mold, mildew, allergies, right? They're dealing with chemical stresses that we already talked about, lead, mercury, particular matter. They're dealing with uh, physical stresses like noise pollution, light pollution, right? And also heat issues, right? Heat waves are hell for the poor and the elderly, okay? And they're also dealing with psychosocial stressors that we already talked about. So it's the intersection of those, those stressors, those chemical and non-chemical stressors or those chemical and non-chemical agents so when you think about the cumulative impacts of living in a community with, with the EJ issues, you've been exposed to multiple things. So think about the social ecological model. You got to think about these issues from an individual level, right? Family unit, right? Meso level and then macro level. 
So environmental justice science is what I'm talking about. These issues are uh, co complicated and complex, but I would say that our science, when it comes to community with EJ issues, does not keep up with exposure. Our, our, our science is not keeping up with these risks that they're dealing with, and our, and our science is not keeping up the health impacts that folks experience uh, who live in communities with EJ issues. So think about air pollution as an example. If you live in a community with, with a lot of air pollution, right, you could be a mother with developing fetus. That fetus has been impacted, right? So think about, uh, I think the third, I just been research on the third trimester, well, different uh, just, uh, impacts on infant mortality and birth effects and look at the links between, you know, air pollution and birth outcomes. We're looking at third trimester, uh, uh, work by Ponce uh, and, and, and REITs and others. So bring an EJ, uh, uh, Tracy Woodruff brings an EJ angle to understanding uh, the risk for mothers, right? Mothers who live in communities with air pollution. Uh, think about uh, the impacts for children and these symptoms of window susceptibility, right? And they're exposed to air pollution, not just asthma, but other kind of health effects. And so air pollution can impact you across your whole life course. So that early impact during pregnancy, early exposure to air pollution during pregnancy can impact you after you're born for the rest of your life. That's the EJ issue. And then you think about getting COVID-19, why COVID-19 hit some communities so, so much harder than others, because in communities of color, for example, there's so many air pollution sources, both mobile and stationary, right? So think about SARS-CoV-2. When you have reduced lung capacity or respiratory capacity, you are an easy target for SARS-CoV-2 to get COVID-19. And you add in, you know, lack of access to infrastructure, uh, comorbid conditions, right? And these other stresses that people experience. So the, 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 you know, the effect modification that occurs, right? So just wanted, I'll keep it moving, but just wanted to share that. Then you think about climate change. Go to back to my other, other side, slide about pollution disadvantage, pollution advantage, same thing. Those contribute least to climate change are the ones that impact the most by climate change. Those for, uh, contribute least to air pollution are the ones impacted the most by air pollution, right? So you think about why is that? NWCP has done some reports about you know, the, the differential burden of, 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 of you know, power plants and our more power plants are in uh, you know, communities of color. And think about, again, I would say just to slow down a little bit, because I got way too many slides. I know we will get the questions. I would say that most EJ issues, y'all, let me slow down a little bit on this point. Most environmental, I mean, you hear me use the term EJ, I'm talking environmental justice. Most EJ issues are actually energy justice issues. Let me, let, me, let me spell this out to you. So think about the life cycle of, um, of fossil fuels. So this report and others, when you think about extraction of fossil fuels, right? So well pads, uh, mining operations, uh, fracking, for example, studies have shown that those practices disproportionately impact communities of color and low-income communities, right? Then pipelines, transport of uh, fossil fuels. Studies have shown, you know, they disproportionately impact communities of color and low-income communities again. Then refining of fossil fuels. Y'all know about the Kansas Alley, that 80-mile quarter between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Uh, you got all these refineries. You think about Richmond, California, you have refineries. You have refineries across the country, right? Those refineries, again, whose communities? There's an overabundance, uh, above average number of people of color in those communities that host refineries. And then combustion of fossil fuels, power plants, whether it be coal or gas, whose communities, right? Uh, highways and byways have already said about the National Highway Defense Act, uh, you know, uh, segregation. Who's, whose communities host these highways and byways? If you live in Detroit, if you live in Chicago, if you live in D.C., whose communities with four or five, six lane neighborhoods? We talk about Tulsa and, uh, you know, Harlem. And you think about Charlotte and Durham, how these highways and byways built their communities. Uh, many of those book, Roof Shop, just destroyed a lot of black and brown communities. But what it left was what? It left a changed ecosystem where we have more impervious surfaces, we have more concrete asphalt, but we also had more cars burning gasoline, more trucks and buses burning diesel. So it really not just fragmented, but it destroyed those, those ecosystems. And so created uh, risk gates, created um, sacrifice zones. Okay. Another report from NWCP, things across the fence line, again, Getting back to where these facilities are located. Again, who, again, the energy continuum. So you go from extraction, transport, processing, combustion, and then waste. Whose communities at each life cycle of fossil fuels disproportionately communities of color and low-income low communities? So you think about what does that mean for, for you know, 
climate-related perturbation, forest fires, tornadoes. Y'all saw what happened in Kentucky. Uh, you see for forest, you know, historic forest fires, forest fires in California and other parts of the country, right? You see the historic drought right now in California. Remember the Pacific uh, heat dome what was last year, you know, Pacific Northwest, right? You think about uh, 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 heat waves, right? I say heat waves are helpful to pull in the elderly. Uh, flooding, sea level rise. Ironically, as you remember last year, Hurricane Katrina happened 16 years ago, right? August 29th, Katrina landed. What happened last year? Hurricane Ida. We had the most named storms, the history named storms, right? Was it last year or 2020 that hit the Gulf Coast? We had the extreme winter storm uh, that hit Texas. Remember that? So who's going to be differentially at risk from climate change? Economically, socially vulnerable groups. Groups who settlement patterns put them in the floodplain, put them in the, in, in the, in the path of the eye of the storm. A lot of descendants of enslaved Africans settled in the Gulf Coast. Princeville, uh, North Carolina is an example of being flooded out by hurricanes. Uh, you look at New Orleans and other parts of the Louisiana. So you're going to always have these folks because of the intersection of poverty, inter inter intersection of social issues of racism, and not have access to infrastructure, having differential risks to, to these events. Remember Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Harvey dumped, I think, I always forget the number now, 13 trillion to 30 trillion. That's a big difference between 13 trillion and 30 trillion. I got to right, find the right number. Gallons of rain in Houston. Remember, they talk about thousand year flood events. Houston having these thousand year flood events, rain events uh, more frequently. Why is that? Because of climate change, because the amount of, uh, you know, carbon and energy, you know, and what happens in the Gulf Coast and the energy that goes to those storms. Right. And this is the Houston Ship Channel again. So think about that hurricane hidden Houston Ship Channel. What happened? A lot of places got flooded. You got these facilities got flooded. That means you have a lot of uh, pollution from these facilities. Right. You think about the issues of redlining and heat issues. So y'all know about redlining, you know, neighborhoods, hey, more people of color. Hey, we're going to redline you, we're gonna color you red so you can't get loans. We're going to disinvest and divest. Hey, communities, white communities, hey, y'all are better. You're going to give y'all green. Y'all can get loans and stuff. But the, the communities that were redlined, disinvest and divestment, they lost supermarkets. You know, they lost resources, they lost infrastructure. They got more imperfect surfaces. So studies have shown that redlined communities have higher temperatures compared to non-redlined communities, right? Well, let's talk about Baltimore, the urban heat effect. You got a lot of concrete asphalt. Y'all know what happens to the albedo effect. It gets warm in daytime, right? Concrete and asphalt does what absorb it, and then releases at night. So you got these heat islands, right? Many of our cities are heat islands, but who lives disproportionately heat islands? Folks of color, okay? People of color do. You don't have a lot of trees, right? I mean, trees are good for what? Heat mitigation, noise pollution mitigation, air pollution mitigation, right? Shading, cooling. Because in perfect surfaces in our cities, and some neighborhoods not have a lot of tree canopy, you're gonna have issues, right? around uh, heat islands and heat waves, right? And heat morbidity and heat mortality. There was a project called uh, Code Red done in Baltimore a few, years, a few years ago. And students work with uh, local residents in parts of Baltimore neighborhoods to, to basically show differences in temperature, right? And basically you saw 16 to 20 degree differences across Baltimore neighborhoods. But even on the same block, y'all, I'm from Mississippi, by the way, y'all, the same side of the street, look at that first, look at that picture with the tree. You can see a 15 to 20 degree, 20 degree difference of one tree has from house to house, row house to row house. So you think about climate change and mitigation and adaptation and resiliency, you gotta have natural infrastructure. You gotta have green infrastructure. You know, you got Park RX, be all familiar with Park RX. Uh, how can we bring more parks and green space to communities that, 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 are, that don't have it, that are overburdened by air pollution sources? that have too much concrete and asphalt? How can we transform our cities and communities from, from uh, move highways and byways to greenways? You know, food is a, a, an important piece of this too because a lot of folks don't have access to food. We have food coming from rural areas, right? Because they have farming out in the rural areas. Why can't we do more urban agriculture, hydroponics, aquaponics? And let me just slow down a little bit. The concept is food, energy, water nexus. So you can do green roofs, green walls, do permaculture, right? Uh, uh, you do more agriculture in the cities, you reduce your carbon footprint. People have more access to food nearby. You have food forests. So you have natural, more cooling, more shading. Energy bills go down, right? People are learning how to grow their own food. So you increase mental health. You use a cultural well-being, cultural wellness model, right? And then you and you prescribe as a doctor, hey, get out there and get a park. Get out there and do some gardening, right? Mental health, exercise, utilitarian exercise, right? Can contribute to reducing metabolic syndrome, potentially. We got to study that. Reduce carbon impacts, less climate change impacts. You're adapting, right? That's the, the, the way food can be a powerful 
uh, 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 sort of um, a construct. And then you bring in land, right? People can start doing vacant lots. And you oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Wilson. That was a mistake on my end. Could you please? Oh, no. Oh, no problem. I was doing my preaching. You wanted me to slow down. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Let me go back. I mean, let me hurry up. That's actually a good way to like, I got to get through some more slides. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. I, I got in my head a little bit. Thank you. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Thank you for that little that little accident. Thank you. So what can we do? And, and Dr. Mitchell, I, I, I got more slides. So I know you want to get the questions. I just talked a lot. I just did a lot of y'all problematizing. I didn't do, do enough solutionizing. So that's, a, that's I know. I'm trying to be like Jesse. Uh, what you want me to do? We go for another five, 10 minutes, or you want me to shut it down now? Dr. Mitchell, well, you want me to go do? For, for another five minutes? Um, yeah. Okay, and, cool. And then we can, then we can ask for questions. Yeah. Okay. Wait too many slides, y'all. This is what, what this academics would like to talk do. Okay. So a few, few slides I want to touch on and I'll give you, I'm going to go through, I'm just going to do a little, a moose boost real, I'm going to moose boost it real quick. There's a couple of bites. So we go through five minutes. So I do a lot of community engagement. And as Dr. Mitchell mentioned in, in my uh, introduction, uh, I used to be on the board of Community Campus Partnership Health. That's a research for y'all. I'm, I'm currently on the board of the Citizen Science Association. I think community engaged research is a very powerful frame to engage on, on public health issues, EJ issues, climate justice issues. And so I think if you want to do this work, you want to do more participatory action research, you know, and the and sort of like the uh, legacy uh, and anchoring in Paulo Ferrer's pedagogy of the press, or you know, working with communities doing community driven research, right? I do a lot of community-based participatory research. So communities are engaged in all stages of the research process. And why is that? Because community members who deal with these issues every day, they're the contextual experts. I always like to say that, you know, you don't have to have a PhD, you don't have to have an MB, you don't have to have a JD to be a scientist. You don't have to use the scientific method. So we want to create better access to science and scientific tools, which means we can get people to have better science literacy and more trust in science. We get better data that can then be translated to action. That's the power of doing community-engaged work. And that's relevant to these issues of climate change, issues of environmental justice. So I'm gonna skip this slide. I think it's important when, you, when you're trying to engage communities around climate change or EJ issues, any big issue that's kind of controversial or not familiar with, you gotta make it every day, you gotta make it proximal, you gotta make it pocketbook, that's science communication, right? So what are the issues, the impacts, the opportunities, the benefits, the partnerships, right? Like what's going on? And then any issue around climate change connected to food, faith, family, health, and jobs, make it real for folks. The doom, let me say this, y'all. I, I know I'm low on time, wish we had another hour. So I could, I could uh, uh, you know, uh, say my words and pontificate for another hour would be good. But climate change, doom and gloom is not gonna work for the communities I work in. They're already dealing with doom and gloom every day, y'all. Dealing with a lot of pollution, toxic trauma, you know, they're already in, you know, survival mode. That's, that's not gonna work. We gotta bring a message of hope and opportunity and think about the climate economy and, 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 and climate mitigation adaptation. So, how do you bring into your work a message of hope and opportunity uh, and not just doom and gloom, temperatures rising, the world's going to end? They're, the world's already a struggle for them, right? I'm, I'm kind of broad brushing, but you, uh, hopefully you get my point. So food, faith, family, health, and jobs. That makes it real. That breaks it down to folks. I do, like I said, sense of science is another type of, on the science tree, you got community science, which I do more of like communication research, but also sense of science. It's related, but it's on different branches of, this, of, the, of the science tree. It's about, you know, um, democratization of science, okay? So both can work together. And, uh, um, and we try to bring in equity inclusion. We got to get more folks on the ground, more frontline, fence line folks, more people impacted by these issues doing science. So whether it be community science or citizen science, I think it's important. So this picture is Omega Wilson and his, and his wife, Miss Brenda. Uh, I work with them as a grad student. They're with the West End Revitalization Association. So one of my first kind of citizen science, community science projects, I went to UNC Chapel Hill, by the way, go Tar Hills. Sorry, Duke. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we were looking at these, remember I talked about post-slavery black neighborhoods that didn't have sewer and water infrastructure? That community is one of those communities. They were gonna build a highway through those neighborhoods. So what you see a lot in the US, you see highways built through black and brown communities to uh, destroy your churches and, and, and destroy uh, cemeteries, don't care about your living, don't care about your dead. That, that, that was part of the, what was happening with this community. We, they come in with their own research model called Community Owned Managed Research. Equity and funding, parity and management is about science for compliance, not just trying to get that causality, but if there's exposure issues, then we just, we need to act. So science for action, research to action. And what's important is, you know, you know I, I, I try to make sure we focus on doing science that's not about extracts, about action, and not doing what, I, what we like to call pain-pipping science. People are already experiencing pain, y'all. 
You're studying the problem. How much more data do you need? Communities need solution science. They need action science. My center, we do what I call empowerment science, building people's capacity up to have the agency to use the science and tools for action. And then liberation science, liberating them from the toxic traumas they're experiencing, right? That's what communities want, not more and more and more studies, okay? And so we were able to do this community science, see issues with substance and failure and, and war water, well water issues, right? We, we delayed the bypass. It was eventually, we eventually built, but it didn't destroy the black churches. We got them the first time sewer and water infrastructure, okay? You know, I, I developed apps. I'm going to skip, skip through this to, to do environmental policy at the block level. I developed mapping tools. I have developed mapping tools to map environmental injustice. I'm just going to go through this a little real quickly. I'm sorry. I'm going to it. We got a project in North Carolina where we're looking at natural technological disasters in, in Dupla County, North Carolina, and also in Charleston, South Carolina. So engaging communities to, to do disaster resiliency that's very relevant to this topic of, topic of climate change. It's very relevant to the work that you're trying to do. Skip through that. And a big part of my work, just real quick, because I know I'm over time, uh, I do a lot of work around air quality monitoring. And so we're building hyper-local air quality monitoring networks. Remember I said before of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions from combustion of fossil fuels, but also the coal pollutants like PM and O2. And we have a network in Prince County, high schools we're building. We have a network right now in Chevrolet, uh, of Maryland. We're helping to build a network in Brentwood, Brentwood in D.C. We have a work in Southwood in Newark, New Jersey that we, we built. We're working with folks in Savannah, Georgia. We're working with folks in Charleston, South Carolina. We're also working with folks in um, Uniontown, Alabama, which is near Selma, Alabama, doing this air quality monitoring. And so... This is, I'm going to go this end here. Last couple of slides, you know, you think about this kind of work in climate change and environmental justice, you know, you got this example of Curtis Bay in Baltimore. It's a quintessential EJ community. A lot of industrial hazards, so you see from this map, income disparities, okay? Health disparities too. Air pollution disparities, okay? At one point in time, this zip code in Curtis Bay, South Baltimore, was one of the most toxic zip codes in the country. But what I want to end here is the power of one person. Destiny Wofford won the Goldman Prize for environmental activism in 2016. She was a high school student. She, she helped to fight against an incinerator from built in her community. They already hosted Willowbrook Incinerator that's nearby, but they were going to build this energy incinerator. So the reason why I bring this in, they did citizen science, they did community science, they did community organizing to really stop this incinerator. And now the group that's come out of this group, their group is called Free Your Voice. The new group is called the Baltimore Land Trust. They're trying to do a fair development approach to address issues with environmental justice, address issues of climate change, and really empower the community. So for those of you who are in this fellowship program, I think the community science angle, the citizen science angle is a powerful way to do this work and working with those who are doing community organizing to, to, to get to that empowerment science and, and, then, and then implement solutions that, that get us to resiliency. I think it's really important. I just want to highlight uh, this, this lady, young lady, who's now what she's no longer, she's older now, of course, but she started doing this work as a high school student. So I just want to, you know, let you know that you as one person can also have positive ripples through your fellowship and what you're getting on the fellowship that have the same kind of impact in the communities that you serve and the populations you serve. So thank you. And thanks for the extra time, Dr. Mitchell. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sokobi. This is the, that's been uh, wonderful. <clears throat> uh, we certainly appreciate your uh, enthusiastic and energetic in your very wise words, we were just talking about uh, the importance of working with community groups uh, earlier uh, today. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, I was wondering, uh, we're gonna move to questions now and I wanna remind people that they can uh, type questions into the chat box and that we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, also, we will ask people to uh, fill out a survey uh, and so we'll drop the chat to the survey. I, I'm sorry, we'll drop, drop the link to the survey in the chat um, so that people can um, go to that. But before we go uh, to audience questions, I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, children and, and, their ex, uh, and how children of color are um, more exposed uh, uh, to environmental hazards. Well, thank you for that question, yeah. I I, I, I didn't put as many children specific slides, but that's a great question. So uh, as medical professors, y'all know that children, um, you know, have uh, higher inhalation uh, rates per kilogram body weight compared to adults, right? Uh, children, you think of the blood brain barrier and issues of lead and other things, you know, when the blood brain barrier solidifies, so things can cross the blood brain barrier. 
Uh, and when you think about children of color, one example I, I, I think is very poignant. Children of color, and this is kind of pre-COVID-19, disproportionately ride school buses. So why is that important? Well, you know, many school buses burn what? Diesel exhaust. Did y'all know that short-term exposure to diesel exhaust impacts the children's coordination, concentration, and focus? You add that to the fact that children may be living in homes with lead. So you get hit by lead at the house. You can uh, you can hit by diesel exhaust on your way to school. And you think about kids are on the bus or, or walk into school or, or you have island buses outside the school. You know, you have intrusion into the schools. And so that's one way that children of color are more impacted by these environmental hazards. But also, as I've said about lead, uh, children of color live in neighborhoods where you have uh, homes uh, older than 1960. So that they're for problems those homes if they haven't been, uh, you know, rehabilitated will have lead paint. So you can see that uh, with mid-rise cities. So if you go back to the Flint example, uh, of course, all the issues that the children were exposed to lead in Flint, uh, the Reuters study, uh, I think that year, uh, maybe a few years ago said that, uh, maybe four years ago now said that 3,000 areas in the country have blood, lead, uh, people have uh, lead levels. Uh, I think it was water lead levels or blood levels, I forget which one, which higher the levels are found in Flint. So we have a lead, we still have a lead crisis in the country. So lead as a children's EJ issue is still a big deal. Uh, a school bus pollution, EJ health, that's a big deal. And I would say when you think about climate change, uh, children are going to be a more at-risk uh, subpopulation because they're not able, they're not going to be able to escape out of harm's way. Say there's a flood event, a hurricane event, they need someone else to help them, right? They're going to be, they're going to have higher risk of injury as well. And then if you think about the post-disaster phase, so you have the disaster itself, right? When you're trying to get out of harm's way, the post-disaster, if children don't have access to food, they might issues about uh, uh, not necessarily malnutrition, but uh, dehydration and not having food, then children, just like the elderly uh, on the age spectrum, they may also have a higher risk of mortality. And, and then during heat waves, right? Who are the populations that have, have high, very high risk of, of morbidity, heat stroke issues, mortality issues? Uh, children, elderly as well. So there, there, there are multiple ways. During event, children are at risk. Post events, children are at, at risk. And then um, if you have the intersection of multiple stressors, like multiple pollutants or heat and air pollution, children are also at risk, uh, higher risk compared to their adult counterparts. Um, and then children of color, because of unaligned uh, health issues or being overburdened or maybe not having access to infrastructure, they're going to be a greater risk than their uh, 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 counterparts who may not have those economic and social conditions that they're experiencing. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I was uh, talking to a colleague of mine a few years ago when they were having the major floods in Baton Rouge. And he was saying, you know, after the floods, <clears throat> that the um, every time it would rain, the children would cry because they said they didn't know whether the rain was going to stop. Uh, and so, you know, so they don't have the ability to understand. Uh, anyway, there, there are many yeah. effects, I think, in, in, in children. Yeah. And also the trauma, the climate, the climate trauma that folks are experiencing. How are kids, how do the kids experience disasters and how are we providing that support for children who experience, experience disasters, right? And so as part of the recovery phase, are we providing the resources? Do we know how to really navigate that with children, provide that those resources during the, the recovery phase of disaster? Yeah. So, yeah, so thanks for that. I think we'll go ahead and move to questions from the audience. Um, Jordan, what kind of, what questions do we have for uh, Dr. Wilson? Absolutely. So the first question that we have um, today is, what participatory action research training educational or resources do you recommend? Oh, great, great. Thank you for that question. So one of the, the best resources I recommend is uh, CCPH, Community Campus Partnerships for Health. I used to be on the board for eight years and they have a great website. I think they put it behind a paywall now, but it used to be more accessible. So you had to pay that $300 membership fee to get it. But I, I, I'm biased because I was on the board. But I, but I recommend I recommend uh, uh, that entity is the entity. There's also some uh, CBPR workshops that, that that I think some universities are doing. I will look to um, Dr. Um, Barbara Israel's Detroit Urban Research Center. They have a CBPR training that y'all can look to. Uh, and I think there are a few community-based groups that do CBPR training. I think we at for Environmental Justice may be doing a, 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 a CBPR training. But those are the ones that I will look to. Uh, and if you have a local university that if you cannot get the CBPR training, maybe you can get more of the uh, some of the service learning. There's sometimes there's some overlap 
some intersection intersecting between the service learning and the CBPR. That's more for the more on the student side, but more on the where y'all are at your stage. I think you want to look for universities that have a CBPR class. And many of our students public health, the place if you, you define a CBPR class will be the um, Hebe, like UNC Hebe, or the, the health behavior departments will be the place to find those classes. Thank you so much. Uh, next question, Jordan. Yes. Yeah, so the next question, thank you for that. Yep. Uh, the next question, how do we prevent the many health effects from climate change from making children sick? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a very important question. I, I think we have to uplift children more in sort of our you know, like politically, we always say children, we can always tell the short story, children have impact children, we, we get more political action. I think when it comes to our investments in infrastructure, if you think about um, uh, the work that's been done as it relates to uh, healthcare for children, uh, you think about the work that's been done uh, related to, you know, what we can do in K to 12 as it relates to education, right? We got to bring more climate change related education to K to 12. We also have to have a, a, a better focus on children and climate change when it comes to our public health agencies. So our state health agencies, for example, I've been engaging with the Maryland Department of Health to talk more about children and asthma. We're going to bring a we're going to bring a climate change component in. Maryland Department of Health submitted a climate change proposal recently as part of I think with, with the brace framework in it to uh, CDC. That proposal wasn't funded. We have a proposal that was submitted too to that same program. But our climate change work, we have to really have a, a bigger focus on children. That 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 the the, tech, uh, the National Technological Disasters Project that I mentioned real briefly in my slide, we call it CRED. Uh, community resistance to environmental disasters. We have a focus on uh, how uh, disasters would impact children um, in uh, Egypt communities in Dublin County and Charleston, South Carolina. So as part of our disaster resiliency toolkits, we're going to have modules on how we can do more to protect children in those toolkits. So we're working on that. That project, that won't come to fruition for a couple more years, but we do have a component on children and a component on elderly populations who are susceptible, more susceptible when in the Egypt community as relates to disasters. So that's one, one angle to take, just to make sure that you're, as it relates to investments of resiliency, that we uplift children more uh, in our agency work, our county health department work, and also with other uh, partners who may have a, a, a really opportunity to protect children, like our uh, housing authorities too. So there's things that we can do. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, as it relates to our, our school systems as well. Yeah, thank, thanks. That, that's great. Uh, you talked about uh, the need for climate education in the schools. Um, I think we also need it uh, in the university, college, and professional, educa uh, professional education, too. Um, so let's move yeah. on to the, the next question, um, Jordan. Yeah, the next one is, um, Sir Kobe, if you could share some best practices for how to work in successful partnership as health professionals with EJ and other community-based groups um, on the ground around climate? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. One of the programs I wanna, I wanna uplift is to help with that question. Um, so I believe Kresge Foundation has an interesting, well, it's, a, it's gonna be a tangential answer. I'm gonna give a more a, a non-tangential answer. Kresge Foundation has an interesting partnership with the, with the CDC Foundation. So they've been looking at how to uh, address climate change issues in the healthcare infrastructure space. So that's just want to say that real quickly. But I think another part of the Cresty's program, I'm on uh, Cresty Foundation's Climate Equity and Health Advisory Board. So they've been funding a lot of um, partnerships around climate change around the country to bring climate change and, uh, and bring agencies and communities together. So I will look to that um, program because they've been doing evaluation of those partnerships. And that program will provide you with, with some lessons learned and best practices uh, around how we do this work. But I think essentially, if you go back to the slides that I, that I shared, we got to, you know, you got to work with communities, what communities are. So communities and unit identity, I went really fast by that slide, the, the, the CPPR slide. Communities and unit identity. When we talk about developing programs around climate change mitigation adaptation, we got to have communities at the table at the beginning. If you think about meaningful involvement and meaningful engagement, you can't bring them in later. So... That's an important point as well. We want to also make sure we value and uplift community leadership, right, in these areas. So pay people for that time, have equity and funding, equity and resources, equity and infrastructure. That will be important. And if you think about climate change, if we have a climate action plan process, you got to make sure those voices are the most vulnerable. 
are at the table. The most impacted at the table. Uh, we we're submitting a proposal. Um, actually, it should be submitted next week to NOAA, where we are creating a climate. Y'all can take this idea. I'm fine with it. A climate justice academy. The idea is to fund a climate justice academy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to recruit folks from frontline fence like communities with EJ issues and climate justice issues. We're going to have them participate in, I think, a three to six month training program on climate change and climate tools, about climate resilience mitigation. And then they're going to do a capstone project, which will be integrated into the climate action plan for that county. So they're going to be inter interaction with their county agencies. And so that's the type of structure to engage those who are most vulnerable in a training program to understand climate change, give them tools that can be um, be part of the solution and then have them work with agencies and entities that are working to uh, improve infrastructure, uh, increase resiliency. Uh, and we use the capstone project as a way to do that. So that's in, that's in the proposal we, we're submitting on the, hopefully by next Monday. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you're pretty busy doing uh, all sorts of things. Yep. Uh, yeah, we're, we're also the Medical Society Consortium is also uh, working with Kresge. We're one of the uh, funded entities um, and we are uh, trying to um, develop a, a, a guideline on uh, how health professionals can work with community organizations um, and community organizations can work with health professionals. So we're starting to circulate that now. Yeah. Um, and, then, and let's go back again to CCPH. Some of those same uh, tools that CCPH has, it can be applicable to any stakeholder group. So they have a lot of reports and, 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 and uh, on best practices, whether it be healthcare agencies or health agencies and community, community and uh, prof health professionals. That, that's, I think, was one of your best resources in general to, to, for all this work that y'all are trying to do. Okay, ahead, look at that. yeah. Uh, so Jordan, uh, can we have the next question? Yes, um, this one is, uh, Sokobi, can you talk about your experience translating this work directly into policy um, and also how you have framed this uh, when engaging with elected officials? Thank you. Before I, I'm going to respond to Angela's comment. I hear you, Angela. It's urban agriculture, urban gardening, urban agriculture, two different things. <laughs> so we're talking about we're talking about changing the whole food ecosystem. So exactly. If you're in a community that already has pollution, have a lot of uh, uh, mobile sources, you can't use a raised bed. You don't have to use a hoop house. Oh, you sorry, have to can, have a, can you repeat yeah. the question? Can you repeat the oh, question? Oh, yeah. Let me, let me repeat. The, so uh, just so Angela made a comment about urban gardens and environmental contamination. And I was just just supporting her comment, co on her comment. Yet, yes, it's not urban gardening. Urban gardening, urban agriculture are different. But if you can do if you can do urban gardening, you have to be aware of the, the, the legacy pollution and current pollution sources. So a raised bed is not going to work in every case. You might have to use a hoop house. You know, you may have to have some other type of infrastructure. So that's why that's why I was focused on urban agriculture and not gardening. But getting back, so I just want to—I just saw that comment. I just want to respond to that. But getting to Jordan's question, how have I engaged policymakers and how I, you know, translate the you know EJ to policy? So we have. I'm a co-founder of the Mid Atlantic Environmental Justice Coalition. Uh, uh, Mid Atlantic Justice Coalition. We cover Delaware, Virginia, uh, DC, and Maryland. And so that coalition emerged out of a legislative work group. Uh, that we established in 2020. So for everyone on the call, uh, I, I host the annual EJ Symposium. Our next one's going to be, the eighth one's going to be sometime the first two weeks of uh, August. You like the themes. The theme is energy versus power. Y'all like that? Double, and, double, triple meetings there. But that symposium that we had, the sixth one, we, we, we established a legislative work group. We had legislators who we spoke directly uh, around, uh, around on bills. Climate change bills, air quality monitoring bills, human impacts bills, right? And that work group actually was the foundation for this new coalition that we have. So this session, uh, this legislative session, uh, we've been working with legislators for the past several months to work on bills. And so we actually have three or four bills that I've contributed to this session in Maryland, which have environmental justice and climate change in them. So I think the idea is, if you're able to get on commissions, so for example, we have a climate change commission in Maryland, we have an EJ commission. That's one way to engage with agencies and also policymakers because policymakers are on those commissions too. Uh, you can create work groups to work with legislators. And I think also science communication is very important when you work with legislators. And Mark, we made this comment in our other meeting with the Yale, I think yesterday. 
uh, it's not about peer review publications, everyone. When you work with policymakers, you got to be able to get your information to them in, in fact sheets, infographics, white papers, and briefs, right? So being able to communicate the information in a way that's, um, um, what's the word, uh, usable, uh, actionable um, for the policymakers is also important. So we do a lot of that type of work too. Uh, infographics, blogs that can be shared with facts and recommendations. And, and so hopefully I'm going on and on, but I think that we've been able to do that in a good way because we built relations with some legislators over the years and, and we're able to have these work group sessions with legislators and then we also, through our coalition, we're able to engage legislators as well. And we work with some of our advocate partners to work on these bills. And we get we do a lot of back and forth with legislators. So we, we're very engaged with working with legislators in the state of state of Maryland on, on climate change and, and EJ issues. Excellent. Yeah, there was just a question as to whether we can get the link to that invitation. And um, uh, so we can send it out to her. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it out. We, we have to do, um, we're still in progress. We're behind on our uh, save the date. We're still trying to figure. Once I, I'll get to say the date to you, and from there, um, and also, if folks want to see the old, um, just real quickly, if, if y'all want to review the old um, sessions, because we've had a lot of climate change sessions over the years, you can go to um, siege dot center. I didn't get to that. I didn't get to the. I didn't get to the thank you slide, but you just I'm putting in the chat for everyone. Go to siege dot center, and you can go to our old. Uh, we, all this the sessions from last year. I think the last three symposia have been recorded, so you can go. You can see those online. Okay. Go okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So I, I think we have time for one more question, if we can. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. You got um, me, Jordan? Those are the questions, those are the questions that we okay. had. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Well, yeah, we, we're, we are just about out of time, so that, that, that's, that's fine. Okay. So, you know, I know that, you know, we, I know that um, uh, Sokobi, uh, has a lot of information and can continue, uh, but I think we really do need to wrap up. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you for, for participating in our webinar series and would like to uh, thank our speaker. And so I hope that you all found it useful. Uh